Okay, hello. Um, okay. Um, Sorry, I'm a little bit discombobulated. All right. Uh, unless there are questions about anything, I'm going to start talking about Emerson. Um, his dates are. Eighteen oh three to eighteen eighty two. So uh, notice he was he was born sometime after the revolution. So we've moved forward um, quite a bit. Um, I guess uh, Emerson is a very famous American writer. Obviously, uh, maybe he's not always considered a philosopher. Um, a lot of the people we're going to read in this class are are like that. Um, on the other hand, um, the philosophy building at Harvard is called Emerson Hall and has a big statue of Ralph Waldo Emerson. So obviously someone considers him to be a philosopher. Um, um, and I certainly consider him to be a very important philosopher, actually. Uh, we're only reading this one thing by him in this class. Um, next time I teach Phil 107, 19th century, I was going to do it next year, but I think they've switched it to the current course. Um, but anyway, next time I teach it, read more Emerson in that. Um, so, uh, and also in that course, I talk about what Nietzsche might have seen in Emerson. Uh, Emerson was one of Nietzsche's favorite authors, actually. Um, so anyway, um, um, in this course, we're just talking about this one essay, or rather it was originally a speech, right? An oration to the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Um, um, it's one of his earliest philosophical writings, um, it was it, this was shortly after he he published his first book, Nature, that he gave this speech um, in August 1837. So he was actually um, he was 34 years old for 34 years old. Then he had a previous career as a Unitarian minister before he took up his career as um, writer and public speaker, <laughs> basically. Um, um he uh he broke with unitarianism because i guess it was still too orthodox for him <laughs> um uh, all right uh again i'll read, I talk about that more in phil 107 if you want to teach take that um so uh, if are there questions about emerson because otherwise i'm just going to start talking about this essay or speech Um, so it, at first, maybe it seems when you read this, that we're in a completely different world from Jefferson, right? I mean, Emerson is, is notoriously not political. Um, in fact, even in his lifetime, uh, some people were upset that he wasn't more explicitly political. Um, you know, a lot of his associates were reformers of one kind or another, and they were all abolitionists. And some people were upset that at least at first, Emerson didn't take more of an active role in abolitionism. Um, eventually, he did speak out in its favor, but people felt like there was kind of a delay there. Um, and here in this speech, in fact, um, 
he seems to make fun of people who take political issues too seriously. So now, oops, it's not working. Oh, no. It's not what I want. That's my notes. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. All right, let me see what happens. There you go. All right. Now my laptop is running on batteries, but probably has enough. All right. Yeah, so as I was saying, it seems like Emerson is, is making fun of people who take politics too seriously. This is on page 21. Is that readable? Um, some great decorum, some fetish of a government, some ephemeral trade or war or man is cried up by half mankind and cried down by the other half, as if all depended on this particular up or down. Um, and then he goes on, the odds are that the whole question is not worth the poorest thought which the scholar has lost in listening to the controversy. Right? He's advising the American scholar, which is the subject of the oration, um, he's, he's advising the American scholar not to pay any attention to these political up or downs. Um, I should say, by the way, that scholar, um, So scholar, I think in this period um, can mean student. Um, so like there's one place where he says the best scholar is the best master, right? That means like the best student is the best teacher. Um, it can mean just kind of intellectual, I guess. Um, um, and it can mean like learned, person <laughs> like kind of what scholar means now or whatever it means now um so um it's a little ambiguous who he's talking about here but anyway whoever it is he's advising them not to pay any attention to this um to this type of political issue which you know for example the american revolution seems like an it might be an example of some fetish of a government, half of the people cry it up, the other half cry it down. It probably doesn't make that much difference. Um, however, on the other hand, um, if you look in Emerson's Wikipedia article, at least this is where I found this out, <laughs> you'll see that um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., right? So Oliver H Wendell, Wendell Holmes Jr. was a famous Supreme Court justice, but his father was a poet, Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., and he called the American scholar, quote, our intellectual declaration of independence. Um, and of course, uh, it's clear why. I mean, first of all, there's what he says near the very beginning. So this is on page three. Um, this is the original edition, by the way. So, I mean, it was first just delivered as a speech, but then it was printed as a 
very short book um and and this is the this is that original printing perhaps the time has already come when it ought to be and will be something else when the sluggard well never mind that refers to what he just said but when the sluggard intellect of this continent will look for under from under its iron lids and fill the po postponed expectation of the world with something better than the exertions of mechanical skill. Is that really the part I meant to, meant to read? It's not. This is what I wanted to read. Our day of dependence, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands draws to a close, right? That's why it's an intellectual declaration of independence because it says our day of dependence draws to a close. Um, and then there's what he says at the end, perhaps even more importantly. So on page 31, We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. The spirit of the American freeman is already suspected to be timid, imitative, tame. P public and private avarice make the air we breathe thick and fat. Um, so, um, why do I say this is more importantly because um, at this spot on page that I just read on page 31, um, there's not only a sense of a particular people just asserting its right to independence at a certain point in the course of human events, right? Our day of dependence is at a close, um, but also the mention of a universal principle of freedom that someone um, that somehow is supposed to define this particular people, right? The American is supposed to be a free man and not courtly. So um, uh, it's not, uh, Like you may imagine, let's say uh, Sweden is a monarchy and Norway has just um, become independent as an independent monarchy. And someone could say, some Norwegian intellectual could say, well, our day of dependence is at a close. Um, but, uh, but they wouldn't add this other part about the Norwegian freeman versus the courtly Swede, right? This, that, that addition makes this um, like Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Of course, um, then right away we have the worry that the particularity in question, this particular people is failing to live up to that universal principle. Um, and uh, we already saw that, of course, in the like direct, more or less direct responses to Jefferson that we read last time. Um, and we'll see that in um, most of the people we read going for, forward, I would say. Um, so, uh, um, so on the one hand, we have this particular people declaring its independence, only of course it's not its political independence, but it's intellectual independence. Um, and it's declaring its independence because it represents or um, wants to represent freedom rather than courtliness. Um, but right away, there's a feeling that this may not have succeeded. And the blame for it not succeeding is placed on avarice. That is, I guess what that means here is the inordinate desire for money. Um, which we'll also see is, is a common worry in the people going forward. 
Um, now, this obviously is uh, tricky. Because remember, what was the main impetus for the for the actual revolution, for the actual declaration of independence? Well, uh, I mean, there was a whole list of grievances, of course. George III has done that, has done the other thing. But as Bentham points out, the original thing that started it off, like most of those things on that list are things George III did after they started um, pushing back, rebelling. Um, the one that started it off was uh, that the king and the parliament are taking our money. Taxation without representation. So, um, so if avarice is inconsistent with freedom, then either that um, whole process was misguided um, or, um, and as Bentham points out, as, as Bentham objects, basically, um, that has to, that protest against taxation without representation has to be construed as a protest over a principle and not like a claim of monetary damages. So this is what Bentham said. I don't think I read this when I talked about Bentham, but I'm gonna, and I don't have, the text here, but I'm going to show in my notes where I copied it in. Um, here it is. For what, according to their own showing, was their original, their only original grievance, right? As I'm saying, Bentham is pointing out that all the other things on the list of grievances, um, well, at least most of them, I don't know about the one about Quebec, but in any case, most of them are about things that that England did in like response to the original protest by the colonists. The, what was their original grievance? So their um, what, according to their own showing, was their original, their only original grievance that they were actually taxed more than they could bear? No, but that they were liable to be so taxed. Right. So I mean. Uh, Bentham goes on to develop that into an objection because he says there's no government in the world that you're absolutely safe will never task, tax you unjustly. So if you're going to rebel because they might tax you unjustly, then uh, then, as he says, you're striking at the root of all government. It's anarchism. That, that was Bentham's argument. But, you know, um, to not be subject to that argument, you have to say something like, well, um, the issue isn't how much we are being taxed or might be taxed. The issue is where a government gets the power of taxation. And like even one cent without that power is an outrage. And as Locke argued, and um, the colonists were following Locke on this, basically, um, Locke argued that even in an absolute monarchy, uh, taxes couldn't be raised without consent of the people's representatives. Um, I mean, there is no absolute monarchy ever that accepted that position, obviously, <laughs> right? But that was... Um, um, that's Locke's view in the second treatise on government. So that's the principle, the prince, and the, and it's the and it's Locke defends that by saying that people already had property in a state of nature, um, and they came in to, um, when they instituted the government, they did it to protect their property. So obviously, they didn't give the government the power to take away their property. Now, of course, you couldn't, at least Locke thinks, and I guess most people have thought, you couldn't have a government at all without taxation. So there has to be some way the government can take some people's property. And Locke says, yes, but every time it wants to do that, it has to call 
for the people's representatives. This is like some weird echo of this is the fact that um, that uh, taxation bills have to start in the House of Representatives, not in the Senate. <laughs> um, uh, right? It was that it was the House of Commons that had the right to raise taxes. I mean, so wait, is that an echo of what Locke said? It's complicated. Locke is, is trying to provide a philosophical basis for the doctrine that only the House of Commons can raise taxes, not the House of Lords or the King by themselves. Um, okay, so um, that was kind of a long digression. I mean, in, I mean, because I was mostly talking about the real Declaration of Independence, not about Emerson's intellectual Declaration of Independence. But um, um, but what? But Emerson is, uh, I guess I would say, elusively raising that whole train of issues just by saying that thing he says about how um, avarice is what makes it impossible for us to be independent and free. Um, so that the question about how important the actual revolution was, whether it was the kind of thing the scholar should pay attention to or the kind of thing the scholar should ignore comes down to, um, was that principle sincerely maintained? Something like that. Okay, so, so Emerson is definitely talking about independence and freedom. And um, I guess I would say I lost my eraser. This seems to work. Justification of independence. By a principle of freedom, justification of independence for a people, whether regarded as a political unit or somehow as an intellectual unit, um, justification of independence for people justified on a principle of freedom. And then that note about avarice is something about um, how that principle of freedom, um, you know, interacts with the protection of property or something like that. So um, moreover, Emerson in here sometimes talks about a revolution. Sometimes he even talks about the revolution with a capital R. So, um, so, you know, leaving aside what Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. said, I think it's clear Emerson himself is thinking about the relationship between he's, what he's saying and the political independence of America that, once again, happened before he was born. Um, um, in what sense that needs to be repeated on another level? on a more important level, something like that. So, however, um, let me look at one of the places where he does that. Um, and then I think Um, we can see in what in what sense this is 
like the actual revolution and in what sense it's different, more complicated? I don't know. Here we are, this is on page 27. If there is any period one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution? I mean, with a capital R. And um, um, he doesn't capitalize most of his nouns. I don't know exactly when that stopped. Locke capitalizes almost all nouns. Any case, by now, it's more like with us, you only capitalize it if it's important or it's a proper name, perhaps. So that's why this makes you think of the American Revolution, right? That's capitalized. Is it not the age of revolution when the old and the new stand, stand, stand side by side and admit of being compared? So um, so if you just take that part out of context, it seems like he's clearly talking about a political revolution or something analogous to a political revolution, right? And he's saying like, um, you know, the best time to be alive is in the age of... Uh, this kind of revolution, meaning like um, turning over of the old into something new, overturning the old and replacing it with something new, right? And that's the best time to be alive because you can compare the old and the new. Um, however, if we look at the larger context, we'll see that something weird is going on. So here's another capitalized word. Our age is bewailed as the age of introversion. That's the beginning of that paragraph. So introversion. Well, first of all, so why does he say that our age is bewailed, bewailed as an age of intro, introversion? Um, he's he's referring back to what he said on the previous page, on page 26. So let me actually switch back to the document camera. Um, Historically, there is thought to be a difference in the ideas which predominate over successive epochs. And there are data for marking the genius of the classic, of the romantic, and now of the reflective or philosophical age. So this is a kind of um, three-part classification. The reflective or philosophical age hasn't necessarily caught on the way the classic and the romantic did, <laughs> um, but um, but it's it has three parts because it's it's characteristic of German idealism. Um, oh yeah, I don't have an eraser. I have this. So let me write these three up here. Um, classical, romantic, and reflective. Um. Right, so like this is, first of all, it's basically, you know, you might think of it as a periodization of art or architecture or something, um, at least until you get to the reflective or philosophical age. But obviously he means it as something more than that, right? It's a periodization of intellectual climate or something like that. And um, this three-part scheme, the way it occurs in German idealism. So, I mean, I keep saying German idealism being vague. Um, I think the clearest version of it would be in Hegel, but I suspect that in Emerson, it's um, he's deriving it more from either directly from Schelling or from Schelling by way of Coleridge. <laughs> um, so, um, but be that as it may, this three-part scheme, um, um, I guess I should also say, 
but as if I don't mind interrupting my sentence yet again, <laughs> I should also say that it's not only characteristic of German idealism, it's also characteristic of ancient Neoplatonism. And both German idealism and ancient Neoplatonism are like um, uh, important influences on Emerson. Things that Emerson, periods that or schools that Emerson likes to allude to and um, like to read, right? So, and so what is the, the three part scheme? Well, it's basically like the idea is that something first exists immediately as itself. And what the thing that here is, I was I was kind kind of trying to to find a term for you might call it culture, right? I call it uh, like the intellectual I forget atmosphere or something like that. Um, so whatever that is, it exists first immediately as itself, and then as a kind of difference from or emanation from itself. Um, So the first one would be classical, and the second one would be romantic, understood as a kind of like rebellion of classicism against itself, something like that. Rebellion of culture against itself. Um, and then finally, um, everything finally exists as a reflection out of self difference back into itself. Right, so reflection is one of the words that's used for this. Another word that's used for it is reversion or conversion. Um, um so um it, or as emerson himself said in the passage i read before from page 27 introversion <laughs> right um these are all terms for this same stage of reflection back into itself of what has emanated into self difference Right, so in the original Neoplatonic context, you have like the one beyond being emanating all the different levels of being out of itself. And all then all the em emanated beings turn back towards their source and try to be adequate to it in, the, in whatever way they can. Um, this is among other things, a Neoplatonic, interpretation of the scene in the Republic, in the in the parable of the cave in the Republic, where, you know, the um, the people who are chained at the bottom of the cave have to be freed and then they have to be turned around. That's like, that's the conversion that we're talking about here. They have to be turned back to the light. What's, you know, it's what's not clear in the original platonic context is that that's where they came from to begin with. They came from the light and now they're turning back to it. That's kind of the Neoplatonic um, gloss on that parable. Um, so, and we can see from what happens again in that paragraph on page 27 that um, Emerson now is using revolution as another synonym for this, right? Our age is bewailed as the age of introversion. That is, People, um, people say, well, you know, these ages were great. They they produced great art because people were confident, or they produced great uh, intellectual achievements. Because right here, people are just confident that their culture is right and that the way they do things are good, and they they go forward and try to conform to those standards. Here, they're confident that. Um, um, they need to rebel against standards and exert their own individuality or something like that. But here, when we turn back and reflect, people feel like this introversion is a kind of um, loss of confidence. 
I think, I mean, I think that's what Emerson is talking about. And he, and he says things like that in this context, right? So that's what people are, that's why people are bewailing that we find ourselves in an age of introversion. If only we found ourselves in one of these confident classical or romantic ages, but then Emerson says, must that needs be evil. And then so farther down um, um, as part of the explanation why it, need not be evil <laughs> is if there is any period one would desire to be born in is it not the age of revolution so revolution um of course also means turning around it's not from the same um verb right like wolwo and Huerto are not related to each other um but it does also mean turning around right like the revolution of the earth or whatever and in fact the reason a political or scientific or whatever revolution is called a revolution is as i said because it's like a kind of overturning of the old in favor of the new So revolution can also mean conversion or reversion or introversion. Actually, um, Descartes in the first meditation, when he talks about getting rid of his, all his old opinions in order to reach new uh, um, certain opinions, uses the Latin word aversio for what he's going to do so like aversion <laughs> okay. aversio i guess it's that one anyway um right so revolution means what it usually means because we're thinking of turning the old order over like upending it right but here emerson um, while maintaining some connection to that, and after all, again, he starts off by declaring independence, so this that some, has something to do with what he's doing, has also reinterpreted to mean like turning around, revolving on your axis. And so like, um, um, Oh, I was just writing on the board and I didn't, I wasn't showing the board. I'm sorry. Now you already read this. This is what I wrote. Wrote a versio. <laughs> Descartes it talks about this eversion of my old opinions. Um, so, um, Right, so now I just noticed because I wanted to go back to the document camera and I was already on it. Um, if there is any period one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution when the old and the new stand side by side and admit of being compared? So now it's like um, the old is not on its way out. Rather, the new is turning back to the old reflectively. <laughs> Right. So like, I think the sentence deliberately bears both of those meanings. This is very typical of Emerson. And it's one reason why Emerson is only one of many reasons why Emerson is very difficult to understand, um, which uh, also, I think, helps explain the affinity between Emerson and Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is very hard to understand in a similar way. Um, so um, um uh so revolution bears both of these meanings but in the second meaning of reversion or conversion um it should also be compared to conversation now um this is also i guess i mean that ambiguity is typical of Emerson, but also this playing with the literal meaning of English words is also typical of Emerson. Um, 
I remember uh, years ago when I was struggling to understand anything at all in Emerson. And I think I'm doing a little better now, though not that much better. But in those days, I was a grad student and I asked my advisor, Stanley Cavell, who's like a, who was an Emerson expert, you know, of a kind. He wasn't really an expert exactly, but an Emerson follower, maybe I would say. Anyway, I, you know, I I told him I was having trouble understanding uh, Emerson's essay called Compensation. And he said, you have to hear the thinking in compensation. And I, at first, I didn't know what he was talking about, the thinking in compensation. But of course, compensation... This part means thinking. <laughs> Right, like pensare means to think. Oh, um, so among other things, I guess. But anyway, so that's what he meant. You have to hear the thinking and compensation. And of course, I mean, Emerson can play this game because we don't hear those things in English usually. We don't hear the turning in conversation. We don't hear the thinking in compensation we don't even say compensation right we say compensation <laughs> um and uh i think uh when we use revolution in a political sense we don't hear the turning in revolution either um is it too much of a digression to say this maybe but i'm gonna say it anyway because it's one of my favorite facts <laughs> and it and it helps to it helps to explain something about Emerson, but also something about Heidegger, which is that Heidegger likes this same kind of game, but in German, all the words are transparent, right? Like in German, you know, um, so like Heidegger plays with Umwelt, which means environment and umsehen, which means to look around and all these various other things using um. And like a German speaker can't not notice all these ums. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I mean, why there's that difference in German and, and English? Uh, is, I mean, there's reasons, but it doesn't really matter. But but they're different, you know. So like when Heidegger says philosophy speaks German, um, which is what he said at some point, <laughs> um, he wasn't just, I mean, uh, he was expressing something that was connected to German nationalism that, um, as you may know, got Heidegger in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, but he wasn't just, it wasn't nonsense. There is something different about German as opposed to English as philosophical languages. So like Heidegger couldn't do what he does in English and Emerson couldn't do what he does in German. He's using something about English. Um, and he's constantly using it. And I mean, you have to ask why is he, you know, what is he using it for? Like, he's both saying something and not saying it. He said it. And I'm about to read you a passage like this. In fact, maybe I'll read the passage first. And then you can see what I'm talking about better. Every day, the sun, and after, sunset, night and her stars. Ever the winds blow, ever the grass grows. Every day, men and women conversing, beholding and beholden. Um... So, 
so on the one hand, he, um, what he clearly says is that, um, what he clearly says is that men and women talk to each other. I mean, but why is that in that list? Um, what he also says, maybe a little less clearly, is that men and women are the converse of each other. Now, I don't know if he means men are the converse of women and women are the converse of men, or whether he means, because, right, this sentence is ambiguous, actually, men and women conversing. Does that mean men are conversing with women? Or does it mean there's a whole bunch of people, men and women, and they're all conversing with each other? <laughs> um, but uh, but men and women, or, or, or either severally or collectively, are the converse of each other, like night and day, like uh, wind and grass, um, so here's a quote from Walden. Actually, well, it's a quote um, that we'll see. I think this is in our reading that Thoreau quotes uh, Confucius. Here, I'll show it to my notes again. This is a quote from C Confucius in Thoreau's Walden. You who govern public affairs, what need have you to employ punishments? Love virtue and the people will be virtuous. The virtues of a superior man are like the wind. The virtues of a common man are like the grass. The grass, when the wind passes over it, bends. <laughs> so, um, so there's a, I mean, uh, so I guess, is more complicated than I can explain. <laughs> On the one hand, there's the idea that these people are con converses of each other, like night and day. But, um, but wind and grass are not exactly converses of each other. So I guess that's the right way to put it. We have, we have two different, you know, um, ideas of what the conversation of men and women might be like. Is it like night and day? where night and day just alternate? Or is it like wind and grass? Where um, the wind is like above the grass and the grass kind of turns under its influence. Remember what we're talking about here throughout this essay is the influences the first in time and the first in, in importance of the influences upon the mind of the scholar is that of nature right so there's an influence there's a flowing in of the wind to the grass <laughs> um, and the grass bends or turns and you know, so in in uh, a literal interpretation of the quote from Confucius, um, whether this is what Thoreau is using it for, Thoreau's, as we'll see, is even harder to understand than Emerson. <laughs> um, but um, like in the literal, in, literal, in the literal, literal metaphorical interpretation of what Confucius is saying, this bending indicates that the grass obeys the wind or, well, I guess what? That it, not that it obeys the wind, that it imitates the wind, right? Because remember the, the context in Confucius is that uh, the, the virtuous, um, what next? The virtues of a superior man are like the wind. And the cot, so, right, so the, to, in order to rule, you won't need punishments. 
this sounds kind of anarchist actually <laughs> not that confucius could be called an anarchist right but if you take this quote out of context it sounds kind of anarchist there's no need for punishments why because the superior person um all, all we need is for the superior person to be virtuous and everyone else will follow along. So it's so what the wind is doing in, in bending is like being a kind of image of the wind. Uh, sorry, what the grass is doing in bending is being like a kind of image of the wind, right? Like the way things down here are images of the forms and the forms are images of the one beyond being. <laughs> this... Um, um uh that as i said is like the literal metaphorical meaning but you can also look at this grass as like bending over to to like look up <laughs> right like the reason the the everyone else becomes virtuous when the superior people are virtuous is that the influence of the superior people flows down on them and they bend over to look up at it So, so this bending over here is a version of that aversion. <laughs> Emerson plays with that too sometimes. I'm not sure if I remember him doing it in this essay, but with the fact that version also means turning, right? <laughs> anyway, like um, this bending over is another version of this reversion or conversion. <laughs> Um, the turning around of the the people at the bottom of the cave on their way back up to the sun. Um, um, so, like, did Emerson say all of that in that sentence that I read? I mean, he did and he didn't, right? Like, he said, every day, men and women conversing I haven't even gotten to beholding and beholden, right? Which has a whole other issue because beholden doesn't usually mean that someone has beheld you, right? It usually means you're like obligated or something. But anyway, leaving aside beholding and beholden, every day men and women conversing, he just said that little, those three words and, um, and he didn't say anything about converse or conversion exactly but he did say it because he said conversing <laughs> and again it's like english allows him to do that to to say it but um if you don't have the ear for it and i don't think i have very much <laughs> But uh, I got what I have from Stanley Cavell that, you know, if you don't have the ear for it, you just read right past it. So now let me, let me say one other thing about that one sentence before I go on, which is about the beholding and beholden part. Um, So, um, so I take it what Emerson means is that this reversion or conversion is, um, and this, I guess, is connected to why it also can be called reflection. It's a beholding of that which beholds. Um, so it's like that by which we are beheld, it's that to which we are beholden, but it's also that by which we behold, so to speak, like as if beholden meant like, as if you could say, my eyes are beholden by me because I behold using them. <laughs> um, so, and this is the thing that at the end of Walden, Thoreau uh, calls, quote unquote, the light that puts our eyes out, 
right? There's there's like it's the I mean, so one thing that means it obviously and in context at the end of Walden is that you uh, it's a light so bright that it puts out your eyes, right? Like if you stare at the sun, it will make you blind. But I think another thing it means is that here's the light and it kind of puts out eyes like, you know, like a snail <laughs> put out its eyes. <laughs> this is the light that puts our eyes out. So, um, so when the the reflection is, so to speak, turning the the eyes around to see the light that put them out. <laughs> I think Emerson is saying all of that also in that one sentence. <laughs> it's not even a sentence; it's a sentence fragment. Oops, I was drawing something on the board and you couldn't see it. Um, and there's also something in the chat that I haven't responded to. Hold on. I don't know how long that was. When I drew the grass, was I showing that? Yes. Okay. But when I drew this light putting its eyes out, I wasn't showing that. This is what I was saying. The light that puts our eyes out means like the light is like a snail, like putting eyes out. <laughs> right. And and the the moment of reflection or reversion is of those eyes like turning back to the thing that beholds using them. <laughs> That's the sense in which they're beholding and beholden. <laughs> um Okay, so I mean, I don't know. I mean, you might not buy all of this. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, but I think it's there. I mean, again, remember what I showed you on page 27, how he switched from inversion to revolution where it's, they're clearly supposed to refer to the same thing. When he's trying to, to mitigate the, or um, um, deal with the complaint that this is an age of introversion, it isn't that bad. And part of the answer is that the best period to be born in is an age of revolution. So I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that revolution and inversion are supposed to be somehow equivalents there. And like, once you have that, well, and you know a little bit about Schelling and Proclus and whatever, then <laughs> all the rest of it um, is kind of straightforward. Um, all right. So anyway, so I'm so I'm claiming that like all of that is packed in when when Emerson talks about revolution. So how does that connect, though, with the other sense of revolution, which, again, as I said, I mean, he can't be he can't not mean that because he is talking about independence. And he is talking about independence of the American scholar. Now, like whether. Um, so in his essay nature he, he, emerson wrote a book called nature and then a lot later he wrote an essay also called nature which i think someone wrote a paper about it called like emerson's second nature <laughs> anyway um right so in his essay nature which is much later than this i forget the year of it um uh emerson talks about um um settling in a new yet undiscovered America in the West. <laughs> um, meaning that like this America might not really be America. Um, America is not discovered yet. 
Um, so like whether the American scholar means the scholar living in America, I mean, like, of course it means that. He's giving an oration to the Phi Beta Kappa Society. <laughs> Right. He's talking about, you know, I mean, he's talking about how every year we, you know, we meet to celebrate the advances of American scholarship or whatever. So, yeah, he's talking about the United States of America. But um, but on the other hand, there's, there's, you know, there's some ambiguity whether the American scholar might not just as well live somewhere else or whether the people most of the scholars here might not be american or whatever but in any but 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 on some level at least uh, on some abstract or metaphorical level or other he is declaring independence of something from something and that means that um that revolution has to also bear its like more usual well which one is more usual I think it depends on the context, I guess. Um, right? Like if you're talking about solar system dynamics, then you would never think of the political meaning <laughs> of revolution. But, or when you talk about a revolving door. <laughs> but in any case, uh, um, or solids of revolution. Right. But but anyway, so I don't know, not the more usual, but... Um, The one that you expect to see capitalized when you're talking about America and Europe. Revolution as turning over the old order and starting our own new one. Um, and by way of that, creating a new independent people. So um, um, how is that sense of revolution related to this other sense of revolution I've been talking about? Um, so I think the answer is, um, and this is Emerson's approach to the problem of um, how is independence justified by a universal principle? Um, independence from Europe and from what Europe stands for, whatever we mean by courtly here, um, I mean, courtly means a court is, is a place where, and a court, obviously, meaning not a law court, but like the king's court, right? I mean, a court is is a place of courtesy. That's what courtesy means, right? So uh, a court is a place of um, watching everyone else in order to see what to do. Oh, and I keep ignoring these things are in the chat. I'm sorry. Let me look at what has turned up in the chat here. Okay, so Hazel said, this was some time ago, the act of conversation is like the turning of the planet. Every cycle of the sun bestows new considerations. Hence the scholar's preoccupation with the natural world instead of the political world because they want to pay attention to the constant changes of small things that lead to conversions of scale. I personally choose to overlook the gender differentials in Emerson. I, you know, so like to do that in Nietzsche would be an obvious mistake, <laughs> right? Like Nietzsche is really interested in something that he at least symbolizes by gender differences. At least. I mean, he's probably interested in actual gender differences, right? But, you know, but Nietzsche is tricky enough that I don't want to say that for sure. So, like, if you were to read Nietzsche and just ignore that stuff, you'd be missing what he was saying. Now, I mean... That might make, mean that you don't like some of the things he's saying, which uh, um, 
in the case of Nietzsche, is probably a sign that you're actually reading it. I mean, I don't, right? Like, I, I don't think Nietzsche expects his readers to like everything he's saying. That's not the point of it. Um, with Emerson, it's... Uh, It's not such a big theme, I think. Um, it's not clear. I think you're right in this case, as I said, it's he, I mean, I I feel like at the at a minimum, he must have deliberately left it up in the air, whether it's men and women conversing with each other, or whether it's, as I said, a whole bunch of people who are both men and women all conversing with each other. Um, you know, so I think like at a minimum, he's raising the issue, whether you can ignore this or not. Um, yeah, if I could also add, there's another part in uh, this one in the third section of uh, the concerns of the American scholar, where he says that Pete, the clergymen are often uh, looked at as women, which in that context, seems to, I mean, obviously he's saying look like as, as women um, in the context of how women were generally treated. But if we were to understand that today, uh, you would probably, you'd probably say something more like they're treated sort of like infants um, or just as yeah. like people who are, who are not capable of caring for themselves in totality. Um, right. So, so um, in that case, like it's, it's tempting to say you could just translate it into something we would say. Is that what you're getting at? Um, yeah, yeah. Also, because and in in the case of the quote that you were talking about, it seems obvious that he doesn't mean women in the same way as the kind of derogatory tone that he had when he was talking about the clergy. Um, or maybe he does, but either way, it's it doesn't seem particularly useful to designate someone in the situation of conversation like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So, like, as you know, uh, not long ago, at least, uh, there were a lot of feminists who were talking about the different ways that men and women talk. Um, right? So that, uh, you know... Um, uh um i mean you know the famous carol gilligan stuff about men are for mars and women for venus etc it's like about different conversational strategies or something like that um you know um like it's not obvious that that is to be ignored when you talk about literal or non-literal i mean right the literal sense of conversation is turning around <laughs> the other one is not literal i mean so i mean but on the other hand yeah maybe it should be ignored i i don't think in the other context by the way i don't think the use of women is derogatory what he's saying is that that people um i mean it's I think it's left up in the air whether this is any better of an idea in the case of women than it is in the case of the clergy, right? But he's saying that people treat them as needing to be protected from, uh, um, I don't know, from real difficulties or something like that, right? And so they they never learn the true language. They only learn mincing words or, you know. So uh, I guess they need to be, they need to be protected from having to take action, I think, right? Because that's what the third section is about, that the scholar learns by acting. So, um, you know, I, I guess one more thing to say about this is that Margaret Fuller, so again, I, it would make sense to read a lot of Margaret Fuller in this course. The only reason I didn't do it is because I didn't want that much overlap between this course and 107. <laughs> we, we read that one thing by her. So, I mean, she was the editor of Emerson's magazine, The Dial. Um, and she was the author of Woman in the 19th Century, which, I mean, although it's not exactly the kind of feminism that says there's no difference at all between men and women, which even today is controversial among feminists right whether that's the right way to go or not 
um the um it's de yeah it's definitely a stridently feminist work right so i mean that's the kind of people who are in emerson's circle so it's not like he's not aware of the possible problem here um he didn't have to say women he could have just said men conversing right um and no one would have blinked but he decided to put in women and then yeah it's not clear is he putting them in because they're the opposite of men because they're lower than men or because um um you tend to forget they're there right you tend to think men means everyone and forget that everyone includes women <laughs> or some other reason right i mean you know, like, for example, because of something Confucius says about men and women, <laughs> or all of the above. So, I mean, it's really like, I think with someone like Emerson, it's very, it's difficult to say. It's no more, it's no easier to understand than the other things he talks about, really. Um, so, I mean, all of this is by way of getting back to Hazel saying that it's better to ignore or overlook these things. I th I think it's probably not. I um, I can certainly see the temptation to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, I mean, for one thing, you may miss some subtle way in which Emerson is actually, you know, um, trying to undermine what people think about gender differentials. Um, and that could be important. Or even if that's not true, um, as in the case of Nietzsche, Nietzsche, like I said, Nietzsche is also complicated. I mean, look into Nietzsche's personal life sometime and see what that says about how he thought the relationship between men and women. But in any case, like, uh, um, let's say with, you know, who would be a good example of this? Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle is a good example of this, right? Like Aristotle, after Socrates proves in the Republic that, and in the Mino, really, that uh, the, the difference between men and women, whatever it may be, is ethically and politically irrelevant. Aristotle, as usually, comes back in defense of common sense, which common sense then is that men should lead and women should, you know, um, be secluded. Right? So, um, um, so Emerson comes back in defense of that kind of common sense, and uh, and I think we can say that it, not Emerson, Aristotle, and I think we can say Aristotle is like completely sincere in thinking that, you know, uh, women's intellectual fact faculties are meant for obeying men. <laughs> um, so uh, um, in trying to defend that against other philosophers of the time who were denying that, not only Platonists, but Epicureans and others. Um, so, um, Nevertheless, it would be a big mistake to ignore that when reading Aristotle, because it's part of what he's saying. It could turn up in all kinds of places, like when he describes matter as female and form as male. All right, I'm sorry, that was, I probably spent more time on that than I should have. Um, and, and I didn't even finish reading what Hazel, Hazel wrote. It's not so much that it's man and woman, but it's any meeting of individuals who come to realize that their minds are constantly in reference to each other despite appearances. As night and day seem like opposites, but are sections of a circular form that bleed into each other. Yeah, of course, that's another meaning of revolution here. The holding and beholden is, an, is the equivalent of the statement that self-reliance is secretly an expression of a certain kind of responsibility towards others. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do think that that's part of what it means. Yes. And I, that was what I was about to talk about, sort of. Um, 
So those are all good comments. Um, and we, I don't know, we may or may not disagree about whether you should say, um, well, he didn't really mean, or maybe he did, but you should ignore that he really meant men and women. And you should, you should substitute something that makes sense for us. Um, um, I do actually agree with you, but I think it's me overlooking it is not the right way to phrase it so much as I think that if Emerson had the language of our time regarding like gender theory, um, he might phrase these things a different way. He might. Yeah. But that's such a wild counterfactual. What would Emerson be like if he were in our time? <laughs> you know, what would Nietzsche say if he were in our time? I, you know. Um, what would he say about how society comes to treat criminals when the herd dominates? What would he say about, I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, it's a good question, but it's really, I, I don't, I'm not saying it's a bad question. I'm just saying it's really difficult. It's actually, I mean, we read these people partly to try to to learn to use their language to say things. So, um, which is really different from the reason a historian reads something, right? So the question of what would they say if you asked them something they never could have considered is, from a philosophical point of view, is a really good question. I'm told that historians are very irritated when, when philosophers ask that type of question. I don't know from experience of historians getting irritated. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, I do think that beholding and beholden are also, like I said, there's more than one meaning in every word here. Um, okay. Oh, so, and here's this other comment from Jonathan. Um, could they not be put out in the sense of destructing, destruction, like gouging or something? Yeah, well, as I said, I mean, when Thoreau says at the end of Walden, the light that puts our eyes out, eyes out is darkness to us, the, you know, the straightforward understanding of that is if something is too bright, then it looks dark because it puts your eyes out. So, I mean, that, you know, that certainly is one of the things that sentence means. I mean, not, we're, we're going to read the conclusion of Walden, so maybe I should talk about it more when we get to it, but like... You know, I mean, not far before that, Thoreau talks about how wrong it is to uh, um, to demand that authors should mean only one thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so it does mean that now as or as in putting the eyes out, as in the eyes might typically take in light that the light is visible for us is something that comes from outside in, but could there be a light that's so bright that the light that would be typically inside of the subject, in this case, the eyes, goes out blind, but also necessarily extends out, going inside out, or I lost it. All right, I kind of lost it there too at the end, but it is... Um, this is something I talk about more, although we don't read Thoreau in 107, so you can't have both at the same time. Um, but uh, there's a lot of stuff in Schelling about the light that sees. <laughs> or is that Coleridge? Or both? I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so, I mean, it is the light. Another complication is that a lot of people used to think that, that vision works by something going out of the eyes. <laughs> the theory that it works by light coming into the eyes like had to kind of gradually be argued for. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I mean, I, I think that's part of my image of the light putting out eyes. 
that the light is seeing, the light is so bright that it has eyes. <laughs> Um, okay, but anyway, getting back to Emerson. So, um, and like I said, Hazel, this is kind of like what you were talking about, I think, about what self-reliance is. So by the way, like it would have made a lot of sense to read Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance in this course. But again, that's like one of the main things I talk about in 107. And this I never would get to otherwise. And it's, seems even more appropriate. So not having room for both, I, I chose this. So anyway, um, I think, you know, because this, this also is about self-reliance in the sense that it's about independence. And um, what I was starting to say is that for Emerson, independence, um, from the courtly so there's like a where can i draw this or, this is like nature it has no beginning and no end it's it's constantly conversing with itself in the sense that the converse is always conversing with the converse. <laughs> um, uh, this is an important image in um, uh, in Coleridge, and it's also at the very beginning of Emerson's essay, Nature, about finding ourselves on a stairway that leads up and leads down, and, and that we don't see an end either way. You know. Nature is is this kind of endless self difference spread out. Um, but um, and as long as you're caught in that and not reflecting, right? So this is like this is the moment of self difference, as Hegel would call it, or the moment of procession, as Proclus would call it. Um, uh, the the plural as opposed to the one as in Kant's table of categories. This is like being outside of itself, and I think you can understand the courtly as a version of this that is unable to turn back. So, like I said, you're always watching other people to see what to do, and declaring independence from that means turning back, but it means turning back not to something old, right? Because the old, whatever is old is part of this. By the way, it's part of Nietzsche's solution to this issue or reinterpretation of this issue to connect the no beginning and no end into a circle. That's the eternal recurrence. Um, but OK, we're not in Nietzsche, we're in Emerson. So um, um, so, so, like um, turning back out of this is turning back to the universal source from which all the self-difference emanated. Um, and this is related to the thing Emerson keeps talking about, about the um, philosophical doctrine that all minds are one, or that all men are one, or that there's there, or the fable that there used to just be one man, and then the gods split him into, or should we say them, <laughs> into many men. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, now I hope I have enough time left to talk about this. Page 
He learns that in going down into the secrets of his own mind, that self-reliance or independence, right? I'm not going to look to the men and women who are conversing with me every day. Um, I'm going to convert down into myself. It's going to be an age of inversion. Um, I go down to the secrets of my own mind. He has descended into the secrets of all minds. He learns that he who has mastered any law in his private thoughts is the master to that extent of all men whose language he speaks and of all into who, whose language his own can be translated. Right? So like, um, by, by turning back to the universal source, turning back to the universal source is independent. And um, um, it seems like this is this is why I said it's related to what you were saying about this, Hazel, that that like um, um, self-reliance is wait, how did you put it? Um, Self-reliance is secretly an expression of a kind of responsibility towards others. It's that it, um, by mastering my own private thoughts or mastering a law of my own private thoughts. So a kind of principle here from which this diversity emanates. By mastering a law in my own private thoughts, I'm um, mastering the thoughts of everyone who I can converse with. Um, all men whose language he speaks and all into whose language his can be his own can be translated. Um, And so, like, this actually suggests an understanding of what's going on in the Declaration of Independence. Yes, the, so this is why, like I said, you know, to begin with, that, that it seems like we're in a different world from Jefferson, and it seems like Emerson is unpolitical, but the more you go into this essay, the more you say, see that he is still working on the same issue that Jefferson is. And the, the suggestion is that... Um, in breaking free from our uh, particular attachment, that's when we're thrown back on universal principles. So like, you know, you might, you might also call this the empire, right? Like the evil empire. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, that's hidden behind me. Before I had written nature there. Like uh, the empire tries to achieve universality only by going in this direction, along that dimension. Um, um, and that's why it's essentially courtly. And to be breaking free of the empire and becoming independent means being thrown back on universal principles. So, I mean, this, like, it suggests an explanation of what's going on in the Declaration of Independence, but it's not one that resolves the tension. It's just another way of understanding what the tension is, I guess, maybe, right? Because, um, Because we what we want 
to say is that somehow this independence appears as a particularity on this line. You know, it's, um, these are the American scholars. <laughs> but this principle is universal. This principle is the, is the principle of emanation of the whole line. When I learned to master my private thoughts, I learned to master everyone's thoughts. So why doesn't this result in um, um, replacing the evil empire with a good empire? <laughs> with uh, the Galactic Republic or whatever. <laughs> um, um, why does it result in a people separating from another? And I mean, I, I don't know, but I think um, so there is something in this essay. I mean, I guess like there, there's kind of there's kind of three possibilities here and one of them is the one we want i mean why do we why do i say we want it one is the one that jefferson is trying to articulate and it seems like emerson is trying to articulate which is that this revolution or you know conversion in this direction creates a kind of particular image um in the realm of nature or in politics um and that's hard to understand as opposed to, on the one hand, the idea that, that this would have to be a universal revolution, um, that it wouldn't be complete until it was it happened everywhere, so to speak. Or on the other hand, that it's really private. Um, and the, the sense that I made a master of other people's thoughts is not political. He does talk about an orator as one of his examples in that thing about looking into yourself. And I see that I am out of time. <laughs> uh, So I guess I'll just say that, like, I, I don't see a uh, uh, resolution of this problem in Emerson, but, um, or I don't understand a resolution, but I think he's trying to resolve it. Um, I mean, he says these things that sound anarchist, right? About like the sovereign individual which of course is that's another thing that turns up in Nietzsche later. Um, uh, but um, the essay ends. Well, that's not the end. Oh no, I guess I meant the passage about the sovereign individual ends. that um, this is the last thing I know I'm going over, I'm sorry. Um,
So when he says that the tendency which he seems to approve of is that each man shall feel the world as his, and man shall treat with man as a sovereign state with a sovereign state, tends to true union as well as greatness. Right? So despite everything, um, Emerson is still putting himself on the side of union. I mean, that's definitely a loaded word in this context. Revolution, independence, union, the, the union of the colonies. Um, so uh, somehow he, he does think that this can be the result. Um, I wish I could say a little bit more, although not very satisfactory about it, but like I said, I'm already out of time. So uh, I will see you next time and talk about Thoreau. I should have had a whole class about Emerson, but I mean, a whole course about Emerson, but oh well, <laughs> see you next time.